we are continuing to look at the seven goals that economies have when it comes to macroeconomics. So we've looked at improved standard of living and economic growth. So now we're going to look at full employment. <clears throat> All right, so what do we mean by full employment? Full employment means that everybody who wants a job can find a job. Now, having true full employment is impossible, right? You're never going to have a point at which everybody who wants a job has a job. And that's because some unemployment is always going to exist. We are always going to have some frictional and structural, structural unemployment. Frictional unemployment is voluntary. So perhaps you are tired of winters in Alberta and you long for the beaches of British Columbia. If you quit your job here in Alberta, you move to BC and you start looking for work, you are frictionally unemployed. It was your choice, okay? So because we like to move around, right? Live in different places, because we might get tired of what we're doing and want to pursue something else, we will always have some frictional unemployment. So when we talk about full employment, there's still going to be some people who are unemployed, but we're okay with some frictional unemployment, right? Because we're going to move around and, and change what we do. There's also going to be structural unemployment. Structural unemployment is where you have changing demand patterns. So we aren't buying what we used to buy. All right, so for example, you probably haven't gone out lately and bought a VHS cassette or a Betamax, right? Can't even find any of those anymore. There's changing demand patterns, right? We don't even go and rent videos anymore, DVDs. We download them, we stream them. So our demand patterns change. Well, that means that we don't need businesses that are manufacturing VHS cassettes. We don't need companies creating a Betamax. There's changing demand patterns, which means the people who work in those industries get laid off and they have to go find a job in some other industry. And that can mean having to go and change their skills. So maybe they're coming back to college or going to college for the first time to get training in a different area. So we recognize that there is always going to be some structural unemployment because we're not gonna continue to buy the exact same stuff that our grandparents bought. So we're okay with some structural unemployment as the demand patterns change and our skills no longer match those jobs. But the challenge with structural unemployment, and we'll dig deeper into this later this semester, is the fact that it can be very long lasting because not everyone is willing or able to go and get new skills to match the new jobs. So we're okay with some structural unemployment. Too much structural unemployment can have long lasting effects and we'll look at what we can do about that later this semester. So when we talk about full employment, the theoretical definition is everybody who wants a job has a job. But in reality, we recognize that there will always be some frictional and structural unemployment. So when we define full employment, according to the organization for economic cooperation and development, and the OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, this is a collection of countries that are competitive economies. So France, Germany, US, Canada, we're all members of the OECD. So we, the OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, defines full employment as having an unemployment rate between four to 6.4%. The reason it's a range is because depending on what you make in your economy, <clears throat> you might be more likely to have these types of unemployment that we're okay with, but also we actually measure unemployment differently in different countries. And we'll dig a bit more into that later this semester, looking at how the US defines unemployed versus Canada, because it does make a difference. And in fact, when we look at the unemployment rate between Canada and the US, we have to make an adjustment 
to the numbers in order to truly compare. And the OECD is taking that into consideration when they're putting in this range of 4 to 6.4% being the definition of full employment. So we measure full employment by looking at the unemployment rate. And we are at that full employment if we are between 4 and 6.4%. Now, how do you get full employment? Well, you stimulate economic growth because if we can get producing more goods and services, then we need to hire more people to do that. So full employment, standard of living, and economic growth, those three tend to kind of move together. If there's more, if we're making more stuff, then there's more jobs, then we have more income, which should mean we are, we have access to more goods and services. So the first three goals tend to move together. So how do you stimulate economic growth? Well, this semester we're looking at just that question. So we're looking at you know, government spending, changing taxes, increasing the availability of cash in circulation, changing interest rates. All of these can encourage businesses to expand and produce more and hire more people. Some of the challenges with this goal is that full employment can lead to inefficiencies in the economy. And earlier this semester, we looked at the in the Hindustan, ugh, my brain is not working, the Hindustan Fertilizer Company. And in that, in the Indian economy at the time, right, the priority was jobs, full employment. And so we're creating full employment by creating jobs. But as we know from that example, the in that case, since the priority was jobs, it didn't really matter if the company was making any usable fertilizer. Okay, so when you put your primary goal at full employment, it can be at the expense of at economic growth if you're not aligning those incentives in terms of produce being more productive, more efficient. If we're, if we're only focusing on full employment, well, then we can create all kinds of jobs and it doesn't matter if they actually do them or what they do in them. Uh, people get paid, they can now afford uh, their basic necessities, right? And so as we look at these goals, how much of a priority are you putting on one goal versus another? Or are you putting a priority on multiple goals that can be achieved at the same time? The other challenge with achieving full employment is that there is an inverse relationship between unemployment and inflation. So the next goal we're going to look at is stable prices. But the challenge is, is that it's hard to tackle both of them simultaneously. And let's, let's walk a bit through why that's the case. So the graph you see here is what is called the Phillips curve. And the Phillips curve looks at how changes in the unemployment rate impact inflation. It does not say anything about how inflation or changes in price impact the number of jobs because there is a relationship that direction as well. But the Phillips curve is only telling us about how unemployment changes prices. Okay, so let's walk through this. If the unemployment rate is high, okay, then we don't have jobs, okay? And if the unemployment rate is high and we don't have jobs, then we can't afford to buy stuff. And if we can't afford to buy things, there is a decrease in demand for goods and services. And if people aren't buying things, what happens to the price? How do you get rid of the products that no one's buying? You put them on sale, we lower the price. And so high unemployment go, coincides with low inflation. During recessions, right, people have less income, demand for goods drop, we tend to see deflation or low inflation. Now, we can also look at this from the perspective of the wages that are paid for jobs. So if the unemployment rate is high, then we have lots of choice on who to hire, okay? And if we have lots of choice on who to hire, who do you hire? You hire the best for the least amount of money. 
So when the unemployment rate is high, you have lots of choice. You're gonna hire the best for the least. And that's gonna cause wages to go down. Well, if it costs us less to, to get a worker, then the cost to make our product is also gonna be less and that's gonna make prices go down. So high unemployment, low inflation. Well, what if we have low unemployment? If we have low unemployment, we're all working, okay? There's lots of jobs. And if, there's, if we all have jobs, then of course we are all getting paid, we are all spending. And if we're all buying lots of goods and services, then we're all demanding them, right? That creates shortages of different goods and services and it drives up the price and we get higher inflation. We can also look at it from the perspective of wages. If the unemployment rate is low and you are looking for people to hire, there's not a lot of people to choose from. Everybody already has jobs. So how do you get good workers? Well, to steal them away from the competition, you're gonna have to pay them more. So wages go up, and when wages go up, the cost to make the goods go up, and so we have higher prices or inflation. So we get this curve showing that as the unemployment rate goes up, inflation goes down. And what the Phillips curve is really talking about is that there's this point at which when the unemployment rate gets too low, it triggers inflation. And when we talk about the OECD's definition of full employment, this is the level that triggers inflation. So wherever you are for your country between that four and 6.4%, so for example, if Canada's full employment definition is 5%, when the unemployment rate falls below 5%, then it triggers inflation and we start to see prices go up. So that's full employment benchmark also tells us about when we start to trigger this relationship with inflation. All right, so the question is, where are we? What is our current unemployment rate and where have we been? So here you can see the unemployment rate for Canada over time. Okay, that big spike you see there, that's the Great Depression. Uh, during the Great Depression, 1929 to about 1932, 33, what we see is the unemployment rate hit the highest ever at 20%. Here we see that 2008 recession, okay, where we see our unemployment rate uh, just below 9%. Now, we do need to point out a unique period of time in the 70s. So we said according to the Phillips curve, when the unemployment rate goes up, prices should go down. And we're gonna look at stable prices in our next uh, goal. But the 70s were a unique time period. They're a period of what is called, hmm, they're a period of stagflation. Stagflation is a period of high prices and high unemployment. According to the Phillips curve, that isn't possible. That should not be happening because when the unemployment rate goes up, people aren't buying, prices go down, there's lots of workers to choose from, so you pay the you get the best for the least, wages go down. So when the 70s hit and we saw both high prices and high unemployment, people were quite confused because all the measures that we have to fix the problem, they didn't work. So let's walk through this a bit, okay? All right. So what happened in the 70s? What happened in the 70s is that, oh, we had a decrease in the supply of oil, okay? So uh, oil is primarily coming from the Middle East, a decrease in the supply of oil. And we're gonna draw some supply and demand graphs, but we'll get into more detail about those demand and supply graphs and how they're structured later this semester. So if the graphs freak you out at this point, 
Um, we're just using them to show graphically what's happening, but we'll dig into how they work a little bit later. All right, so here we have demand and supply for oil. If there, and then we have price and quantity. If there's a decrease in the supply of oil, what that means is at this current price, there is now less quantity available. So a decrease in supply is a shift to the left. Okay. And when there is less of something available at the current price, we have a shortage. Well, if we all frantically need something and there's less of it available, we're all fighting each other for it. And that's going to drive up the price. So a decrease in the supply of oil causes the price of oil to go up, right? We go from here to our new equilibrium here. Well, the challenge is, is that when oil is in everything, right? It's in the gasoline. So if you want the apples at the grocery store, we have to truck them in. The apples are now gonna cost more. So the price of everything goes up. Uh, Tupperware, um, your tires on your car, right? They're all made from oil. So the prices of those things go up when the price of oil goes up. So we had a decrease in supply of oil caused the price of oil to go up, which is the price of everything went up. All right, so if the price of everything has gone up, can you afford to buy everything you bought before? No, right? So we're gonna buy less goods. You're gonna delay purchasing the house, the car, because more of your money is now going to groceries, okay? Well, if we're buying less goods, then do we need as many workers making goods? If people aren't buying um, cars, do we need to be making as many cars, right? So people get laid off. And when those people get laid off, right, typically what happens is the unemployment rate is now high. Excuse me. <laughs> People get laid off, the unemployment rate is high. What should happen according to the Phillips curve is that now we have lots of choice for workers, for those that are producing, and that'll make wages go down, which makes costs go down, okay? And then that will make the prices of the goods go down. So we should be able to then fix the economy by coming back and changing this piece here, right? The prices can go back down because wages have gone down. Well, the problem was, is we should have seen a decrease in wages. We should have seen a decrease in cost to make the product. We should have seen a decrease in price, okay? But this piece didn't happen. And when you have your costs already high for a business, right, the supply side, then demand side approaches tend to just make things worse. So what did we do? Well, we could do things like have the government spend to stimulate the economy, create jobs for people. The idea is to put income in people's pockets and get them spending, okay? The challenge with this though, is that when the government spends to create jobs and make income go up, What it's doing is a demand side approach, increasing demand, and now we have more people chasing those same goods and it causes the prices to go up. So using the approaches that we used during the Great Depression, that fiscal policy of government spending to stimulate the economy during this time just caused further inflation. At the same time, we did things like increase the money supply So the money supply increased. If we have more cash in circulation, then that means it's easier for people to borrow. And the idea here is that if it's easier for people to borrow, they're borrowing money in order to do what? Buy stuff. And that increase in demand makes prices go up. 
The same time in the 70s, we're seeing these high, these high prices, we're seeing a lack of production, all right? We're seeing people get laid off. It's not self-correcting because the prices and wages are not falling, which should lead to more jobs and more affordable goods. So the government steps in, and we see this both in the US and Canada. They step in and say, okay, well, let's implement a minimum wage. Let's make wages go up, okay? Well, according to the Phillips curve, what should have fixed this problem is that when people got laid off, wages should have done what? They should have gone down, which would cause the cost to go down, which would cause the prices to fall and fix our problem. But instead what we did is we implemented a minimum wage that raised the wages, okay? So that people could afford these expensive goods. Well, when you raise their wages, your income goes up, your demand goes up, and we're back to more inflation. So often the mechanisms we were trying to use to fix the economy when people were buying less goods, so we had a lack of economic growth and high unemployment, we were making it worse and adding to the inflation rather than addressing it. And it was really because this was a supply side shock. And most of the theory up until the 70s was how to deal with a lack of demand. When there's a lack of demand, the government can spend and that gets people spending, that creates jobs, creates economic growth. Or they can change the monetary policy and get more money in circulation, get demand up, get income people's pockets and they'll buy things, which means more jobs and, and get growth. So the approaches we made in the 70s to address this issue prevented the Phillips curve and from it fixing itself because we didn't let wages fall with our minimum wage and our approaches to fix the economy were all demand side approaches causing instead more inflation. So the 70s were a unique time of high prices and high unemployment. Well, what about now? Where do we currently stand? So we looked, here's that 2008 recession. Okay, there was a recession in the early 90s and the early 80s. We tend to have them about every 7 to 11 years. And this tiny sliver is all in 2020. So right now, and the unemployment is quite high, and this is COVID-19. So as we look back in terms of, well, what happened with stagflation, the question becomes, what do we do about COVID-19? Is it a supply side issue and it's high prices, meaning we buy less goods and that's why people are getting laid off? Is it a demand side issue where we need to put more income in people's pockets and make it easier for them to borrow so the demand will go up? Okay, so we have to consider what is driving that high unemployment when we look at how to fix it. So when we talk about 2020 and COVID-19, the unemployment rates you can see here in July 2020 show the impact of that. So here you can see Alberta at 12.8% for July of 2020. And in fact, we can look at a comparison so in July 2020, the Canada average is 10.9%. And in July of 2019, Canada was at 5.7%. Okay. So you can see a doubling in the unemployment rate uh, because of COVID. As a comparison, uh, the U.S. in July of 2020 is looking at a 10.2% unemployment rate, and in 2019, it was 3.7%. So remember, if it falls below that 4 to 6.4%, you're starting to see inflation. So here we have a quickly growing economy in 2019 and quite low unemployment. The risk there was inflation. And now... We look at Canada and the U.S. and the unemployment rates in the 10% range. And now the bigger concern is not rising prices, but instead lack of jobs. And so we can look at how do you stimulate the economy to get those jobs. 
If you want to compare Canada and the US, you have to do an adjustment based on how we calculate unemployment. So to compare Canada to the US, you actually have to remove 1% from the Canadian calculation. So when you do that, oh, and my face is in the way, so let me just uh, move my picture here. When you do this here, you notice that we go from 10.9% to 9.9% and we fall below the US unemployment rate. This adjustment is based on the different definitions in unemployment. And so it shows you that Canada is a little better off during COVID than the US. We can also see by province what's happening. Uh, so who's being most impacted? Newfoundland tends to have the highest unemployment rate across provinces regardless of what's happening. Um, Alberta was down at the bottom a year ago and now is got one of the highest unemployment rates. We can also look at unemployment rates, not just of everyone, but of um, youth. Okay, so students 15 to 24. And um, this is actually from 2015, but you can see a comparison of different countries. At that time, youth unemployment was about 12.9% down here. You can see other countries like Greece, Spain, Italy have quite a high unemployment rate among youth. And what's happening is, is that old people are not retiring, so more jobs are not becoming vacant. Um, we're not seeing tons of innovation and new industries and businesses being created. So there's not opportunities uh, for young individuals looking for work. And that creates a lot of unrest within the country and, and becomes a, quite a political issue. Before we leave this goal of full employment, let's ask the question of who are the world's largest employers? So where, what companies hire? So you can see here at the bottom, uh, there are 3.2 million people who work for the US Department of Defense. That's the world's largest employer. The Chinese army is two at 2.3 million. And then you have Walmart and McDonald's at three and four.